I think I got everything ready. I'm going to start talking about lighting. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to start talking about how, how at least the, the old fashioned way of simulating light. Okay. Now, this is where there's a huge difference between the old OpenGL and the new OpenGL. The, uh, the, what we're going to be talking about is the lighting from the 1990s. The, the, the whole purpose of like the new OpenGL that's completely different than this old OpenGL is to make lighting much, much better. So, and that's the, but to do that, you, need, you really need to program the GPU and it's, it's, there's a, it's a lot more complicated. So we're going we're gonna to introduce the idea. It's actually, this is a very good model for starting out. It's really hard to teach lighting using the new OpenGL. It's so complicated that it's hard to teach it. So this is a good way to actually teach it is to start with this essentially kind of old fashioned baby form of lighting. And then maybe we'll have time in the rest of the semester after we've done the baby, we can switch to the uh, shader based, GPU based lighting. We'll see if we can uh, make the uh, transition from that. Okay. so. What we're going to do is it's, it's a, what we call a model for lighting. You know, what we're not going to do is physics. You know, now, if you go to Pixar, that's the cutting edge. The cutting edge is to do physics, to actually literally say, you know, what is the physics of light? What's the physics of cloth? What's the physics of skin? How do photons bounce off of materials? And actually use huge amounts of computing power to do as much physics as possible. Now, uh, someday they'll do, it'll be all done by physics. Right now, what we're going to do is a model that's barely based on physics. So we're going to do a model that just very tangentially has anything to do with physics. It just does a halfway decent job of simulating uh, the appearance of light. You know, it, it, it's roughly based on, loose, very loosely based on physics, but not very closely. Ultimately, people want to just essentially do quantum mechanics and compute where photons go and essentially do what our eyeballs do, compute you know, everything about light. Right now, the state of the art is somewhere in between. The, 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 the actual state of the art in lighting is a lot of physics, but it's still not a simulation of real light. They, they haven't got to that point yet. So what you run on a GPU is uh, much more physics than, than what we're going to talk about, but it's still not the physics of light. Okay. So what we're going to do is now there's a pretty good explanation of this in this, oh, see this book here. Notice that this book says OpenGL 1.1. Okay, 1.1 is essentially the original version of OpenGL. So we're really talking about the old way of doing lighting. Okay. And he's got you know, some pictures here. You know, let's, let's just start talking about the pictures, the idea of what we're gonna do. Okay. We're gonna model light as essentially it's got two components to it. This is not, you know, this is not the way real light is, but we're gonna model light as, as it comes in two flavors. There's what's gonna be called the specular light and diffuse light, okay? Now, there isn't specular light and diffuse light. There's just one light source, but like that light source in our programs will emit two kinds of light. It'll emit a spec, actually it's gonna emit three. He, he actually forgot one. There's actually a third kind of light called ambient light, but it doesn't come from a light source. Yeah. Uh, you notice that if, in this room, if I turn off all the lights, there's still light in the room. Where's the light coming from? The windows. Windows, but where's that light coming from? Sun. Can you see the sun? Not right now. No, so that's called ambient light. And this model, that's called ambient. If I pull down those shades, will we still have light in the room? Yeah. From, well, some light will leak through the shade, but some light will leak through the doorway. If I close the door, there'll still be some light in the room. Some light will actually come through the bottom of the, you know, that, that light is called ambient light. So these are light sources. And we're gonna, we're gonna have, first of all, we're gonna have light, we're gonna have uh, ambient light that comes from light sources. And we're gonna have directional light that comes from light sources. The directional light comes in two flavors called the specular and the diffuse. And what it is is specular light bounces in a fairly sharp way. That's what we think of as like mirror light. Now, remember all light acts, you know, there's only one kind of light. So you have to keep in mind that what this is, is just is a, this is a cooked up, they actually, this model has a name. The, the guy who thought of this back in the seventies, it, it's called the Fong model of light. It's a guy who worked for, I forget what company, but he, he thought, you know, this would be a way to program light 
on a computer that doesn't not very powerful like in the 1970s. And his idea was so good, everybody's used it since then until GPUs became really powerful enough. So this is a model that some guy came up with saying, well, you know, I'm gonna first of all say there's two kinds of light. One kind of light bounces. The other kind of light, what they call diffuse. The light comes in and it doesn't bounce off in a direction, it bounces out in all directions. It diffuses. The, the idea is roughly the difference between cloth and a table, shiny tabletop. Okay, that shiny tabletop is really bouncing light, but this guy is not bouncing light. Light kind of comes in and just, when it comes out, it just comes out in all different directions. Notice that a cloth is very unshiny. Yeah, it's, it's as unmirror-like as you can imagine. This tabletop's almost mirror-like. Like if you polished it, you might be able to see your face in it. So somewhere between this and a mirror, there's these different kinds of materials. Like this is closer to being a mirror-like. This is very far from being mirror-like. These things are pretty, these things are closer. These things are, you know, they're not this, but they do, you notice how there is shiny spots on them. Yeah, that's the specular thingy of it. But it also just looks kind of flat and dull. That's the diffuse aspect of it. My shirt doesn't have any specular aspect to it. Cloth has no specular aspect. A mirror has no diffuse aspect to it. Most things are a little bit of a mixture. And this is what this guy kind of realized, that if he broke light up into two types, he could model lots of different kinds of material. He could, he could basically model the shiny plastic knee of this, the very flat cloth like this, and a real mirror. And his, his insight was to do it by having two kinds, not having physics, but having two kinds of light. Yeah. The, the real physics of this material and the you know, physics of this material and the physics of this material is complicated. He just, it just, he just had this insight that if I break the light into these two kinds of components and just literally mix them, but, but treat them as separate components, we're gonna treat these as separate calculations. We're gonna do specular light calculations and diffuse light calculations. By mixing them, he can have, by, you know, if it's all this, it's cloth-like. If it's a mixture of them, it gets these kind of shiny materials like these. And if it's all specular, then it's actually like a mirror or, or stainless steel, something that really reflects real well, okay? So our model is gonna have two, actually it's gonna have three kinds of light. He's not mentioning the ambient light in here, but it's gonna be specular and diffuse. And then the specular light actually, to make it a little, like mirrors bounce light, light beam comes in, light beam goes out, just like that top picture. But to make things look more like this table, he needed to make them a little less mirror-like. So the specular is actually gonna look like this. A light beam bounces in and it bounces out as a sharp cone. And we'll control the angle of this cone and by controlling the angle of that cone, we can make things look like different materials. Okay, so I'll, what, what, it, now notice that that's a little bit like what's going on over there. But what's going on over there is a light beam comes in and it always bounces out in all directions. The, the diffuse light, bounce, a light beam comes in and light bounces out in every, every single direction. The specular is pretty much mirror light. There's an angle of incidence and an angle of reflection. So this light beam comes in and then there's this reflected line here and there's a little cone around it. And by making this cone sharper, you can make it more mirror-like and making that cone wider, you make it maybe more plasticky like. Okay, so that's gonna be a parameter in our lighting model. Our lighting model is gonna have a parameter that sets the width of this cone, okay? So that's the starting point is two kinds of light. And, and down here, He's showing you what it looks like when you mix those two kinds of light. These are, a, this is a sphere where the sphere has got, a, like this one over here, no bouncing, all diffuse. And if you notice, it looks flat, doesn't even look 3D. Then here, he gives it, a, oh, I'm not sure what he's doing here. I mean, this one's got no, sh shininess is this amount of specular light. So the, oh, the, for some reason, you know, they gave it the, it's actually called shininess in, in, the, in, the, in the, when we, when we call functions, it's the shininess parameter. 
If the shininess is zero, there's no specular light. So that's this one. Let's see. Increase from by 16 from one sphere to the next. Yeah, it increases by 16. I'm trying to remember what that. Uh, so the right side would be the shiniest. Yeah, uh, right. But I'm trying to remember what that number represents. I, I, that, let's see. Uh, I thought it was the, I, I, it's not the width of that. Uh, an open geometry material product in terms of size. The size and sharpness of the specular highlight is shiniest. Is shiniest the width of that? I guess it's the width of that cone. I guess it's somehow measuring, because what, what he's saying is if that cone is real wide, then it almost looks like it's diffuse. You know, it, it's it's the, if that cone is real wide, there's really very diff, little difference between the specular light and the diffuse light. Okay, so if you go up to that picture above, if you think of this cone as being super wide, then that thing on the left and that thing on the right don't look much different from each other. So I guess the shininess is the, is the if I'm it's, it's gonna I think the shininess is the width of this cone. You should have said that. If it looks, if that's what it is, then that would make sense here. Like here, the, uh, the light would, you know, you'd get this real sharp cone of bounce light right there. And then here, these would be wider and wider and wider and wider cones of bounce light. In the first sentence, a specular reflection from a very shiny surface produces a very narrow cone of the reflected light. First sentence of that paragraph. Yeah. So a very narrow cone would be shiny surface. So that's, and then shiny, but the funny thing is, now this is like, this, none of this is physics. So shiny is just number between one, zero, zero, 128. So zero means wider, it seems, and 128 means narrower. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, again, it's not physics. It's just a way of cr cr creating number, you know, just way, uh, using numbers to certain effects. You know, the, the, the basic physics, of course, is light bounces. You know, angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection. That's your starting point. But then, you know, you want to create these different effects, so you play around with it. Okay, let's see. Oh, what else? Now, here, in this folder, I have, here's another person's point of view on this. Okay. okay. I, I remember the, these, these slides are pretty good. So here, here's another way of drawing it or thinking about it. Okay, here's the diffuse. One right ray comes in and it bounces in all directions. And pretty much equal amount, the key idea is equal amounts in all directions. So you think of this as a half sphere here. So the energy of that is spread out equally in all directions. Now, the specular one, the light ray comes in and bounces pretty much in like a mirror, but notice it's not equal amounts. Most of it goes out this way. Some comes out a little bit farther away. Some comes out a little farther away. And that's that shininess component. You can widen or narrow this cone here. But the farther away you are from the center of the cone, the dimmer the light is. So that, that, doesn't, show, that doesn't show up in this other picture. I mean, that's what this picture shows you better. The model includes the idea that, well, he, well here he does it what? Notice he made the edges dimmer than the center. So what it is, is there's that cone but there's less light energy to speak of in this edge of the cone versus how it's mostly concentrated in the middle. This other guy shows it by, and actually this is a better way to think about it because it's gonna have to do with vectors. We will be using vector arithmetic to do a lot of this. And it's actually gonna be, the intensity of this is, met, is re represented by the length of that vector. And the intensity of this is gonna be represented by the length of that vector. We're gonna be doing a lot of dot products of vectors. The dot product of two vectors, the length of one times the length of the other times the cosine of the angle between them. These angles and these lengths are going to play a big role in this. And that's what that's what this guy trying to figure it out. The dot products, physics isn't doing dot products of vectors when light bounces off, but he realized that he could use dot products from linear algebra and actually get something real close to this. You know, that's a vector, that's a vector, that's a vector. We're going to be dotting those vectors with another vector. The dot product of two vectors is the length of one times the length of the other times the angle between them. 
And as this angle increases, that means we'll get a, a lower intensity of, of a dot product. Also, these vectors are getting shorter, which will give us a less intensity of a dot product. So that's a pretty good way to think about the specular component. Now, the ambient component just says light is there. Notice that there's nothing coming in. So we just think of light, ambient is just the light's there. So at this point, so the light is just kind of coming out of that. So, so uh, we just, the ambient light just is there, okay? Now, if we go down here, the other part of this is that we're going to think of light as, we're going to have six lights, actually, because we're going to have specular light and diffuse light. Specular light will come in a red, green, and blue shade, and diffuse light will come in a red, green, and a blue shade. And what's funny is you can do weird things, like you can have a surface that's very specular in blue, but very diffuse in red and green. Now that might also just look weird, but you, that's what we're gonna be able to, we're, we're, you know, we're gonna control the amount of diffuseness and the amount of the specularness of each of the three RGB components of this one and the three RGB components of this one. So we're gonna, we're gonna, when we get to the code, you'll see we have tons of parameters. So right now we have six things we, for our light. We have, um, three red, green, and blue specular light and red, green, and blue diffuse light. Actually, we have nine, because then we also have red, green, and blue ambient light. So right, right now, we've already gotten up to nine parameters. That are gonna, it, 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 and there's going to be a lot more parameters. But this model is real rich in parameters. It doesn't have much physics. And it, it makes up for the physics with a lot of numbers. And by having lots of numbers, you can tweak the numbers and get things to look OK. So. Down here, he lets you play around with some of these parameters. Okay, so here's a teapot, and that teapot's like, like it's got what we call a material property. A material property is the teapot we've chosen for the teapot. These nine numbers, you know, we've chosen a certain amount of diffuse red, diffuse green, diffuse blue, speculative red, speculative green, speculative blue, ambient red, ambient green, ambient blue. Okay, okay. Now uh, he's only showing six of them here: diffuse red, green, and blue specular red, green, and blue, and then that shininess parameter, which only affects the specular here. It doesn't affect the diffuse, okay? And um, he lets you control these, like, um, you know, why does the teapot look gray? Because of the way the light's hitting it. No, look at the, look at the sliders. These are gray. Yeah, material preset, but look at the sliders. All the sliders are at one, so the light is white. So it. And what are the other one? The other ones are also all the same. So it's same, same. right? The gray is when RGB are the same. Yeah. yeah, gray is when the key is RGB are the same. RGB are the same. Okay. If I start moving them around, they won't look gray anymore. So if I just start. Just kind of randomly move them around. Yeah. Yeah, now it's greenish because I left green a little bit higher than these two. Yeah, and, and, and I can make it gray again by just making them all about the same. If I make them all the same, I'll be back to gray. Now I get a different shiny, I get a different, not the same gray, but I get a different, I get a gray, okay? All right, now, no, we'll see. Get rid of all the specularness. So now the thing has only got diffuse. This guy shouldn't make any difference. Okay. Now, you know, it, it looks, you know, it, now remember this is, this is really old lighting. This, none, none of this is gonna look great, but it kind of, it's supposed to look more plasticky, like more yeah. matte, what people call matte. You know, it's, it's, it's looking more like something with like cloth or just something like plastic. Okay, now, Get rid of all the diffuse. Now, now it's black because I took away all the light. Okay. Now give it the specularness. Now I have to make it give, give like, 
oh, it's funny, it's not looking very good. See, there's the, there's the specular highlight. Oh, you can't even see it. You don't even see it. I see it on the screen. I think if I don't, I think what's happening is I shouldn't take away all the diffuse. By, by giving it only specular, I thought I would look at make it, well, let's, let's see, let's try playing around with the shining this a little bit. No, not, not much change. Okay, so just give it a little bit. That's funny. I have to give it more diffuse light than I thought before it actually start, we start seeing it. Okay. But now it's starting to get a little bit more of a metallic look to it. Yeah, I had, I had to give it more diffuse light than I thought to be able to see it, but, but now it has this specular aspect to it. It's got this little bit of shininess to it. So now he doesn't let you move the light around. There, there's actually two components to this. There's the object and the light shining on it. Okay, right now we're manipulating the object, the material of the object, not the source of the light. And eventually we'll talk, we'll, we'll, we'll change both of those. The, 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 because um, if you change the light, you change the way things look. So it isn't just what the thing is made of, it's also the way you shine light. Now in this example, he's not letting us change the light that we're shining. He's only letting us change the material of the, of the object. And it's not looking very shiny to me. Now he's got, now right now we're doing our own tweaking. If you go up here, you can choose like, okay. Okay, that's meant to be jade, okay. So what is it? A, a certain amount of shininess, a lot of green, not you know less red and blue, and just a certain amount of shininess. Okay, does that look like jade to you? Well, of course it doesn't look like real jade, but it looks more like jade than some of the other options do. Yeah, so it looks more jade-like than the other things, but you wouldn't look at that and think right away jade. You'd think okay, greenish. Okay, but okay, but jade is a gemstone. It's got a certain amount of shininess. You know, it's, it's kind of a, uh, like that's probably pretty close to the right shade of green. And then he gave it a little bit of shininess to make it look maybe like a little bit gem-like. Okay, and then like, okay, here's, uh, here's plastic. I don't think that looks like plastic. <laughs> I mean, if you think, you know, usually you think of plastic is not very shiny, but he mostly, he gave this thing a fair amount of specular and you can see this uh, bossing. So to him, this is plastic that's shiny. You know, usually people think of plastic as the, as the not shiny version. Uh, oh, here's the interesting, uh, brass, bronze, and copper. Okay, brass, bronze, and copper. What it is is basically the same color, just slightly less shininess. You know, brass is, yeah, that's why you make doorknobs out of brass. It's kind of a shiny material. Brass makes for nice decoration. Notice that it's got a lot of shininess and you know, a lot of red, a lot of green, not much blue, but it's, you know, it's a lot of diffuse color and a real lot of shininess. And the, the shininess factor, okay, what, what's, what was it? Uh, does anyone remember, what was it? Zero was the, was the wide or the narrow? The wide. Zero was the wide. So what happens if you make this thing even sharper? You don't see much difference. Now, no, now I remember these numbers are not too accurate. Like, notice I see a lot of difference down here. Then that's after some point, hardly any difference. Now, out of a range of 120, about 100 of those numbers are useless, and about 20 or 30 of them are where all the change happens. Okay. Seems like zero is narrow. It's shining more. I think. No, no, no. Zero is the wide, and it's just a lot of lights coming back out at us. I think zero was the wide. Let's see. Now go back up here. Zero was. Uh, the one on the left has shininess zero, which the, the specular highlight almost covers the entire thing. So the, it's so wide, everything looks bright, shiny. It's like staring into a light. Yeah, you stare into a light and you don't see much. 
So that's what we're seeing down here. It's like we're staring. It's 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 just the lights being really reflected a lot in all directions. Now, what does bronze do? It didn't change these much at all. It didn't change the diffuse, but it changed the specular a lot, okay? And bronze looks less shiny than brass does, okay? It's still got a certain amount, of, and, uh, and the shininess didn't change. I think the shininess stayed the same ex yeah, exactly. Yeah, from 28 to 26. Oh, it, uh, some years ago, not that many years ago, people had huge, had websites where they had tables of these things. They would list, like they would have tables of material properties. And you can look up what people thought was the best combination of these numbers. If you wanted something to look like a uh, Lego plastic, or if you wanted something to look like uh, a painted wall, or if you wanted something to look like a, uh, you know, a, a basketball. And, and people had developed these huge tables of what numbers to use for RGB diffuse, RGB specular, and shininess to simulate hundreds of different materials. I remember there were, they're probably still there. There were websites that had literally hundreds of material com you know, combinations of these numbers for different materials. And people it would just, instead of trying to figure out for themselves what uh, uh, cast iron should look like, they could just look up cast iron in one of these tables and get a reasonably good approximation of what people thought looked good for cast iron. Yeah, the thing is that none of this is, is really accurate. It's just, if you pick the numbers that make it some, look like something like cast iron, it's certainly not gonna look like jade. It may end up not looking much different than somebody else's idea of uh, a pig iron, but your cast iron, you know, it, it, these things aren't super accurate, but uh, it's still kind of, you, you, do get, you do get to play around with it, okay? You, do, you, you can make things look different in a scene. Um, you, know, you, you, you can at least make a table in a scene look different than a vase sitting on it, okay? All right, so there, there's this example here, let's just play around. Now, here's another example that lets us play around. In this folder that I downloaded from the course website, there's this uh, Nate Robbins OpenGL Tutors. This is a real famous set of code programs. They were written 30 years ago. They're still on the internet. They're, they're, they were written for this original version of OpenGL and they're nice little demos. So for example, here's a demo of lighting material. Okay. Now, the nice thing about this is he shows you the names that we're gonna use for these things. These are the names that OpenGL uses to represent all these parameters. And okay. Uh, Ambient, diffuse, specular, okay. The K, I don't know where it came from, but somehow the letter K appears into these names. I don't remember where, I don't know if, I have no idea of K, I'm not sure where, why the K appeared in there. But these are the RGB of ambient, RGB of diffuse, RGB of specular. I don't remember what the E is right now. Oh, emission. Oh, emission is, an, uh, Emission is uh, glowing. Yeah. Some objects glow. Okay, so you can make an object appear that light's coming out of it. So it emits light, that's this guy. So these bounce light, this actually emits light. So you can turn something into essentially like it's acting like a little light source, okay? So, so down here, he gives, you know, luckily he gave the names down here because I've forgotten what this, this one's emit. Then this one's the shiniest, okay? So the, the other one didn't show us the emission and it didn't show the ambient either. But these, so notice you have, uh, and then there's, there's this fourth column, this is RGB. This one is the transparency, which as far as I know, it doesn't even work in lighting. I think you, I think you have to set these at one. I'm not even positive, I'm not sure. I don't think they have any effect on these. Okay, so there's the you know, there's all the parameters there. Okay, now this is the parameters for the object. Up above are the parameters for the light source. Remember, the other demo didn't give you the light source to control. The the other demo, the one that he built, yeah, you know, this one's written in JavaScript actually, but this demo just was controlling the material properties. 
And he didn't show you the names of them. He just he lets you use sliders to change the parameters, but he's not showing you the names. This one's kind of nice over here because it's, oh, instead of using sliders, this one adopts a really odd technique that, that, that was, this is a technique that was popular back in the old days of OpenGL. Instead of providing a slider for that number, if you click on that number and you move the mouse, it changes the value. You don't see that trick much anymore, but it was a common trick back then. So like, if I just click on that, see it turns red. Now, if I slide the mouse up and down, see I can, I can move, I can change it. It's actually clever. Yeah, it's pretty clever. First of all, it declutters the GUI because I don't have all these sliders. And as long as you know, you, know, you, know, you know, click on the arguments to move the mouse to modify the value. So you need, you need somebody to explain that to you because you wouldn't guess it. But it, it, it was a clever idea that was real, real popular trick back in the 90s for, for making GUIs to, where you didn't want to clutter up the GUI with a lot of uh, sliders if, if, if the numbers were there in the GUI already as opposed to over here where he does it the more common way these days, there's the number, but there's the slider for the number. Now here, everybody knows to grab that slider, move it around to change that number. So that's kind of, you know, that's the advantage here, but it does clutter up the GUI with a lot more uh, components. Over here, it's kind of nice. You just click on a number and you can change it. Okay. okay. Now these change the material that the object's made out of. Pro we call the material properties. These are changing the light. Now, the lights up here in his model, he shows you a little, uh, this is just to show you where the light's coming from. Yeah. So the light is up here. Like he, he put this in there. It's not part of, you know, you know, light re lights don't show you where they are, but the light's essentially off screen. The, the light is off screen. You don't see the light in OpenGL. Lights are always off screen. Like, see that light there? If you want to model that light in OpenGL, you have to do something really weird. You have to create an object that acts as the light source. And then you have to create a light source, completely distinct from the geometric object that acts as the light source. Then you have to put, you have to make sure that this light source is positioned where the object is, so it acts as the light source from there. You don't have a light source that's an object that emits light. No object. Well, you do, but it's this the special kind of light called emission, which is not very versatile. So, like, suppose you want to model a spot or, or a flashlight. I mean, I should have brought a flashlight. Suppose you want to model a flashlight. You have to do it as two things. There's the geometry of a flashlight. So that would be the vertices, triangles that make up a flashlight. That's one model. Then you need another model that acts as the light source that sits at the same place that the light, the flashlight does, which is which is weird. You would think that you would just be able to create a flashlight model that showed shine light, but open this at least this version of OpenGL couldn't do that. So the lights were separate from the models. So if you had a model that's a flashlight or a spotlight or, or, or you know, a headlight of a car, you had to do it kind of quirky in a quirky way. You created the model just completely as a model, just as just like you would create a model of a hand. Yeah. And then you had to create another another thing that's a light source. And you just make sure that the light source is more or less looking like it's coming from the same place that the flashlight was. So the light source is up here. Yeah. And you, if you said, if you said, what if I extended the view, would I see the light source? The answer is no, you'll never see the light source because it doesn't exist as a geometric object. It only exists as a computational object for doing light calculations. Okay. So he, so that's why he draws this little line to give you a sense that the lights up here shining down here. And you can kind of see how, see how the thing is bright here and darker over here because the light's coming from this side so it's hitting this part but not hitting the parts the back you know the back side like the dark side of the moon the dark side of this guy is not being uh now, now what would light up the dark side would be lots of ambient light like if i gave this scene lots of ambient light that would light up the back side but the the light source is shining from this direction so the light source doesn't get it's like why is the dark side of the moon dark why doesn't the sunlight hit the dark side of the moon because it's tidally locked to the earth. Pardon me? It's tidally locked to the earth. No, even if the, no, there is a dark side of the moon. This, we know this, the same side of the moon all the time. That's because it's locked to the earth. But why is there even a dark side of the moon? There's no dark side to you. No. Yeah, what's, why is it, why is there a dark side of the moon? No, it'd be a light for 
the sunlight to bounce off of to go on the dark side of the moon? What causes the, what? There's no ambient light. The answer is there's no ambient light on the dark side of the moon. Why not? The Earth is the light source. The, the sun is the light source. There's only one side of Earth turned to the moon. Uh, yeah. I, I'm trying to. See, now this is where OpenGL is in physics. Here's the moon, here's the sun. The sun rays go like this, they hit the moon. And this side of the moon is dark. Why? What do you mean there's nothing behind it? There's no light to hit it from behind. There's there's no, no that's actually not the problem. There's no light rays hitting it from our source. Why not? Because the light travels in a straight line and it's except so when it hits things. Right. And when it stops. Right. Yeah. Now what the, 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 the so the question is why is there no light bending around there? Because it's not how light works. It doesn't. No, light does work that way. Light, but then it's, it's not hidden. What? Yeah. What? What's the moon lacking? An atmosphere. Light. Yeah. Exactly. If there was an atmosphere, the light would bend around because it would start bouncing around in the atmosphere. It's the lack of an atmosphere that makes you have a dark side of the moon. If the moon had an atmosphere, there would be at least a little bit of light on the dark side of the moon too. Yeah. Uh, when the sun sets, the sun goes behind the horizon. It's not going to be dark for another 15, 20 minutes. Where did that light come from? It's our atmosphere. Yeah. Like if on the moon, it's kind of dramatic. When you go past that edge there, it's pitch black. Yeah. You know, they, 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 hmm? yeah. Oh, it's real neat. Yeah, because they, they they can do it with 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 satellites. Then you know, nobody's ever walked to that edge of the moon yet. But if you stood on that edge of the moon, it'd be pitch black on one side and super bright on the other side. And no light would bend around because there's no atmosphere. The atmosphere, now, what does the atmosphere do? It diffuses the light. See, that's where that diffuse, yeah. the atmosphere, diffusion is when stuff bounces all around randomly. Diffusion is what heat does. You know, diffusion is what water does when you put a piece of paper in water, the water diffuses into the paper. Diffusion is this a physics idea of, some, of something that's kind of a random process where stuff just bounces around. So this diffuse reflection is, 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 is you know, now here it's diffusing off of hitting a surface, but in reality, light diffuses every time it hits molecules in the air. Every time a light ray hits an air molecule, it bends a little bit. It bounces off the air molecules. So here it's shown as bouncing off the object. See, now that's where the physicists, have, the real lighting equations would take into consideration that this room is full of atmosphere, atmosphere and light rays don't actually travel a nice straight line. They travel pretty much a straight line, but they get hit by molecules in the air. So that's why if you had the blinds closed and everything closed, the bottom of the door, that's why you could see some light on the ceiling. It's the light coming through there, but bounce all the way up. Well, yeah, once it gets in the room, it starts bounce. diffusing. Yeah, it starts it's diffusing. diffusing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, if there was if the room was a vacuum, the light would just come in and go straight to this wall here. And there, there'd be no reason for the light to ever bend. So you would not get any ambient light up there. So the reason we had, even if you if you had if you close the door and you had you could really seal this room, but there was a crack in the bottom of the door, you'd have a little bit of light in the whole room, but it would be it be it would be from the diffusion through the atmosphere. That's why you also usually only see the beam of light that comes from the bottom of the door stop at a certain point because it's all bent away at that point. Oh yeah, yeah, it doesn't keep going because yeah. it's, it's it's diffused itself to not to where you don't see it much anymore. Yeah, because there's a dim light. You're right. If it, if it was a dim, even a dim light, if it never got diffused, would stay dim forever. But it's actually being spread out and spread out and spread out. And after a certain distance, it's just a glow. It's not a beam of light anymore. And, and that's the difference between like a, like a cheap flashlight and a really expensive flashlight. Cheap flashlights don't have good concentrators to keep the beam nice and sharp. The beam of a flashlight spreads itself out and, and diffuses outward. Okay. So now diffusion is really caused by well, bouncing off of things. Now, only, see, this is where it's not physics. The only diffusion we'll get is when lightning hits something. 
But in fact, there's real diffusion happening all the time. There's one version of diffusion that OpenGL lets you do that's all the time. The OpenGL has a special feature for fog. There's actually a special feature built into OpenGL to simulate fogs because it's sort of not like in a lot of games you want fog or smoke, which is a that make you know fog is enough stuff in the air that you really see the diffusion. So OpenGL actually has a special setting for fog, so that you can create a diffusion in the air. But it, it's it's meant to simulate fog and clouds. And and actually, I should have left it in there. This guy um, that did these OpenGL tutors, his act, the, um, he's even got the fog one in there, but I deleted it because I didn't want to clutter this thing up with everything. But if you go to his website, there has to be. Oh yeah, there's, see, there's actually a fog simulated. He shows you how OpenGL does fog in, in, in so you can create this fog. You can have some, an object that's like coming out of the fog. Okay. So, and then again, that that's actually simulating the idea that light does diffuse through the room, but it does it in a real crude way. It still doesn't do physics. It just does it in kind of a crude way. It it, it can be used for simulating smoke, fog, and smoke. Okay. All right now. Now, unlike. Unlike the other one, he doesn't have any presets in here. You know, you, you can just change these numbers all you want. Okay. And, and, but you know, you can just play around with them and you can see how they make, you, know, you, know, you can try to figure out what's changing in the picture on the left as you, as you vary these numbers. Up here, I'm changing the source. Down here, I'm changing how the material interacts with that source. So, uh, Let me kill off. The source is now pure red light. Okay. The source, I turned off the RG, the, the blue and the green. So the source is pure red. Now go down here and make this guy invisible to now if I the torus looks black because there's only red light. But the torus isn't; it's not interacting with. You know, it's it it doesn't reflect. It's reflecting zero red, zero zero red ambient, zero red diffuse, zero red spectrum. So so I see black. What if I let it reflect blue light? Notice that even though I turn, the, you would. I actually thought that nothing would happen over here, because if the if the material. If the source has no blue light, but the material reflects blue light, it should still be black because it, it reflects no blue light and it, it, it reflects only blue light and there's no blue light up there. But in fact, you get a little bit. I think it's just that all, everything's kind of like um, when we see the equation, we'll see that, that, that things bleed into each other. Okay, so even though this object essentially only reflects blue light and there's only red light, I still see a little bit. Yeah. And notice it doesn't look red, it looks bluish. But if it, ref now, make it reflect red light. Now compare the difference. See how bright it is, because it's meant to reflect red light. On the other hand, if I turn off all the red light and turn on only the blue light, Then he's he's dimly red now, even though he reflects. So in a sense, I think what it is is when he when you say that the source is only uh, red, an object that only reflects when um, the the light source is only blue, the object only reflects red, but still the object responds to that little bit of blue light by a little bit. Okay, we're gonna write eventually we're gonna write formulas for all these things. And we'll see how the things that work in the formulas, but it, it's kind of counter to it. I thought that, in the, that unless this is the way he wrote it, my understanding was that if the light was pure blue and the object didn't reflect any blue, the object would look black. You know, you were doing the ambient. Did I delete some? Let's see. You were doing the top one, which is ambient. 
So that might have to do something with it. Maybe. Okay, so this guy, uh, yeah, but there is no ambient, see, there's still no ambient red or green. There's only ambient blue in response to the, now, notice that this has no effect because there's no diffuse light of any kind. Well, there's diffuse blue, but there's, but no, so this one has no effect on it. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, it's only the ambient that seems to matter. Okay, so notice that the, the light source is pure blue. There's blue ambient, blue is diffuse, and blue specular. Now go to, the, go to the material, make the material respond to the ambient and you see something. Make the material respond to the diffuse, nothing. So yeah, there's probably something a little bit special about the ambient light. So notice it's not responding, you know, it appears black. It reflects all only red diffuse light and it's getting only blue diffuse light. So it looks black. Let's do the specular. Yeah, let's try the specular next. So let me turn off the diffuse. Nothing, see? Some, some of the ambient. Something, yeah. So when we see the probably when we still look at the formulas, we'll see that the ambient maybe allows some bleeding. Okay. So it, it re, so even though it the, the only light is blue, the ambient will respond to the blue a little bit at least, but not to not the not the diffuse and the specular. So turn on both the diffuse and the specular, still black. Yeah, you know, it just you know in the in the case of physics, we would say that this object absorbs all the blue light, absorbs all the green light and reflects the red light. So it's reflecting all the red light that shines on it and it absorbs all the blue light and absorbs all the green light. Now that's actually real physics. That's, that when, it, when an object is blue, it's because it absorbs all the red light and absorbs all the green light and reflects the blue light. Okay, that's called additive color model. So that's actually literally physics that, that you know, when, when this guy, you know, this red ink is because the light coming out of there is a mixture of red, green, blue. The red bounces off this guy. The green and the blue are sucked into there and trapped in there. Yeah, the, the red, the, 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 it's literally actually trapping the photons that represent green light and the photons that represent blue light are literally being trapped inside there. They enter and they don't really leave. Okay. So that, that's, the, that's actually physics. That, you know, and that's how you're supposed to think about these things. One means it reflects that light. Zero means it absorbs all that, okay? Now what about, um, oh, and then, now emission is when the light thing, it, it can provide it its own light. So now this, okay. See, now he's glowing red. In this model, you can't tell the difference between glowing red and reflecting red. So this is where there's a sloppiness to this model. You actually cannot tell. That'll, if I set it up so he's reflecting red, I can make it look exactly like that. But right now he's glowing red. That's what the emission, emit, emission means. So he's glowing a little bit of red light. I could also make him glow a little bit of green light. Right? If he glows a little bit of green and red light, he glows yellow. But he's glowing now. He's not reflect. There's no light to reflect. Well, the, the only light is blue light. And notice that the blue light has no effect on what he glows. Okay. So he's glowing these guys. Okay. Okay. Right. So that that's the you know, that's the rough model. There's notice what we've got one, two, three. What's, You got 25 parameters up there, not counting these components here. I'm not counting these. There's 25 parameters you get to tweak. Yeah. And um, this is most of the color model. Yeah. Yeah. 25, you know, now 25 numbers are, are pretty poor stand in for all of modern physics. And that's pretty much what it is. These, yeah, there's, the, the, there'll be a little bit more to this. Uh, there's a couple more parameters. There are actually still more parameters. The most important parameter we're still missing is something called the normal vector. So there's still one more pretty important parameter that we're going to throw in here. And that's another three numbers. It's the components of a vector called the normal vector. So you know, all these parameters are standing in for physics. 
And you, know, you try to make things look a different way by just tweaking all these parameters. Okay. What we'll do is these are, array, these are actually arrays. See, they're actually arrays. They're arrays of floats. Okay. See, they're float arrays. Okay. And you just put the numbers in these and you give those numbers to OpenGL. So you, know, you basically just give these numbers to OpenGL. OpenGL uses them to do the calculations. So all you do is feed OpenGL these parameters. Uh, in the modern graphics system, you have to write out all the lighting equations. Open, the old OpenGL has a set of bare bones lighting equations built into it. And um, I don't remember if I put them in this folder, what they look like. I don't think I did, Steve. Oh, I should have put it. I, I, yeah, I don't think I put the... Uh, Yeah, I have a slide from it that I stole off of somebody's website that was a real good, so it's just one page full of equations that is the, the model, the equations that OpenGL uses. So there's this page of equations that OpenGL has built into it. Modern OpenGL has no lighting equations built into it at all. It doesn't know squat about lighting. And that was on purpose. The idea was you have to program the lighting. Now you can program the lighting as a sophisticated way as you want. If you want to do Pixar style lighting and, you, and you're willing to spend the time to do it, you can get Pixar style lighting. If, if you don't want to use Pixar style light, you can duplicate old OpenGL. But the new OpenGL has no knowledge actually of lighting, which is, which is kind of, you know, it, it, it surprises people because the old OpenGL had all this lighting built in. And then you think, okay, here's the improved OpenGL. It'll do more. And they actually, the improved OpenGL does way less and, but the improved OpenGL says, what I'm going to do is you write the lighting equations, but I'll execute them at blinding fast speed. So the new OpenGL is designed to, to execute whatever lighting equations you gave it at blinding fast speed on the, on the GPU. So its whole design is to be as fast as possible, but you have to cough up all the lighting equations. So you have to write, and you have to write them in this weird language that, that's called OpenGL shading language. It's a C style language. It, it doesn't look like Java, it looks more like C. But you have to write all the equations. Like here, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna feed all these parameters to OpenGL and OpenGL will do all the calculations. If we were using modern OpenGL, we'd have, well, we, we could cook up our own set of parameters. We don't have to use these parameters. We could cook up our own set of parameters, but then we have to write, we'd have to write our own equations and capital. What most people do is they use those parameters and they just duplicate the equations from old OpenGL. In fact, that's what a lot of games do, but not, not games that are trying to be cutting edge, but like a cheap game that's not trying to be cutting edge will basically just take these parameters and duplicate the equations from old OpenGL. Mm -hmm. Can someone make just basically a copy of old OpenGL that just goes with the new OpenGL, I'm assuming? Yeah, yeah, you can just download it. Yeah, yeah there's there's, it. there's libraries that just say I'm open. I I am the old OpenGL. Use me, and, and you can yeah. essentially duplicate the old OpenGL. And then they tweak. Then they get a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. Like there are libraries of of lighting models all over the place. So if you really don't want to write your own light, you just download a game. That's what a game engine has built in. A game engine will have built in a whole bunch of different lighting models, and you pick the one that you want to use. Now, if you use the most elaborate one, your game may not run on an old GPU because it might be too slow. So you kind of sit there and figure out, should I use this super fancy, beautiful lighting model, but then a lot of my customers can't use it? Or I mean, a lot of games, don't they let you, they let you, I think a lot of games these days let you choose the lighting model. You set parameters and, and that's part of what you're doing. You're choosing different lighting models depending on how good your GPU is. But yeah, not many people write their own lighting model. They, they use packaged ones, but they're not part of OpenGL. They come from somewhere else. They either come from a library someone put up on GitHub, or more often than not, they come from a game engine. They're part of the game engine. 3JS, Unity, uh, uh, what's, what's the other really good one? Unreal. Unreal, yeah. Like, yeah. So you know, th they come with lots of built-in lighting models. Okay. And one of them will be the, this one. There would probably usually be one of them that's this, but on a modern GPU, this lighting model, like even Intel's bare bones, cheapest GPU can do this with ease. 
So there's no real reason to use this old lighting model. Even, even cheat games probably use a better lighting model than this one. Okay. All right. So, so now this, this is part of the lighting model. This is the parameters for the material, the parameters for the, uh, the light itself. Ambient diffuse specular emissive, which doesn't get, emissive is only there if you want something to glow. If you really want something to be glowing, so it doesn't get used very much. And then the shiniest parameter. And the shiniest parameter goes with the specular. Okay, so these two go together, right? Um, oh, notice that there's no shininess in the light source. Shininess is a property of the material. So the light source has a specular light, but there's no shininess associated to it. Okay, now. What's so funny is, why did they need specular components both here and up there? If you have a specular amount of light, why did you need a specular amount of the material? And I actually don't have a good answer to that. Maybe they just figured out it worked better that way. So you know, it's possible that you, you, know, you do need a light source. But once you've said that the light source has this much specular, specular light in it, why do you have to tell the material how to respond to that specular light? What if it just responded always one, one, one here? Okay. But in fact, you can choose both. So you control how it responds to the specular light. You control how much specular light there is. Then you, then you control how it responds to the specular light. But here where you have the, the, uh, the shininess component, there's no shininess component up there. I guess it doesn't make sense to talk about a light source being shiny. Yeah, but it does, but it is in this model, makes sense to talk about a light source having this much specular light and this much diffuse light. So it's, a, it's an oddball model. Like I say, it's not physics. It's just some guy thought this up back in the 70s. I think it was in the 70s he thought this up. It worked pretty well on the crude hardware they had back then, and it stuck for a long time. It got used for many, many, many years until GPUs became good enough to do better models than this. Um, we were just looking at this model of light materials. This one lets you just change where the light is. It doesn't change the light material. It just like here, see the lights over here. And it's, this is what I see. And you can kind of tell that the light's shining down on the soccer ball. And down here, you can control where the light is. Oh, up here. Here's the position of the light. See, I'm moving the light. Now that soccer ball has a bit of a specularness to it. Notice it's got kind of a, the black part, especially it's got a shiny spot to it, but he, but he didn't combine them. Like he doesn't let you change the, uh, the, the material properties of the soccer ball. You know, you, the soccer ball's got a fixed set of, you can change the model. Like you can, you can change what you see there. but you can't change the material properties, but you can move the light around. So it, you get a little bit of sense that how, what happens when you move the light around. Notice that this one's got a pretty broad beam for the specular component. See how, when I shine the light directly at it, see how, I, yeah, see how it, the specular part really is wide. So this one's probably got a pretty uh, wide specular cone to it. Now, here's one source to read about lighting. Okay, I mean, uh, there's two sections on it, introduction and light material. He doesn't have many examples of source code. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of source code examples. Like this, this example here is from him, but it's the only source code example he has. Let me just show you what it looks like if you want it. Okay. Those three floating things are, those are light sources, but notice that, yeah, again, what he's doing is he's, he's creating a sphere that's, the, and then he puts a light source essentially inside the sphere. So the, uh, the, the spheres don't actually emit light. This is, the, 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 
the sphere is one model in his program and the light source is a completely separate model. And he just has to make sure that they're always in the same place. So it's kind of complicated because he has to just make sure they always show up. And then, um, let's see. You can rotate this. Oh, it didn't show very well here. There's a, there's a little bit of a gooey to it. You can turn off, like turn, see, see that, that sphere there, I can turn off the light bulb that's supposedly inside of it. And I can turn off and on the light bulb that's in this green one. Same with the blue light. Uh, you can turn off the animation. You can not draw the base for whatever reason he turned that off. Now, when you, when you turn off the animation, you can still rotate this. You can see how that green light's shining there and see how that red light's shining on this side and the blue light there. Now I turn on the blue light, see it's shining on that side. You, do, you can't control the material properties of the, of the uh, teapot, okay? You can't even tell what color the teapot is. And my guess is the teapot's kind of a grayish color because it seems to be reflecting whatever color you shine on it. If you turn off all the lights, it just, I think I think the teapot itself is just kind of it's just gray, so it only reflects whatever color light you shine on it. Okay. And then you can turn off. There's this global ambient light, not much of it. And then there's something called it. I don't know what he means by viewpoint light. I don't know what he means. I don't know what he means by view. That's not a term in, in uh, open. Uh huh. I would guess it's like. Like, like, he, like, he's a, yeah, I think light. that's what I was thinking too. That he means that wherever the viewer is, the viewer's got a light yeah, on his yeah, like a helmet. Yeah, I think that's what, which is, which means he just programmed it there because amb ambient light is an open GL concept. But I think what he's done is he's put a, just a plane right, he's put a, a light right at the plane, wherever the camera is, there's also a light right at the camera, and he's calling that the viewpoint light. Okay, and that's not something you usually do. You usually do not, put, unless you're doing a first person thing where you're walking around with a light beam on your head, normally you don't put a light beam on your viewpoint. The lights are fixed and your viewpoint moves around. But uh, you know, so, so that's not what you would usually do. And also you can't move the viewpoint anyway in this example. You can't, you're not moving around. You know, this guy's rotating, but the, the viewpoint seems to be fixed at one place and it's just shining a light out there. And notice if I, yeah, if I turn off all the lights, I don't see anything. Okay. And if I turn on the ambient light, so there's, there's the ambient light. Uh, oh, you don't even see dark. it. Do you? Yeah, I, I can see it, but it's like a silhouette almost. Yeah, the, the projectors aren't that good. Like, you know, notice that you see it better here. Yeah. The, 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 oh, and you see it way better on that one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you can actually see it. From, I see it real clearly. That one actually almost looks better than this one. Now notice that, see, there's the green light. Notice you've got a dark side of the moon effect here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see that the dark side of the teapot's not really getting any light from that green light. You can see it on the other light bulbs too. Like the other bulbs of light. <laughs> well, I, well, I was gonna say, if I turn on the ambient light, see, if I turn on the ambient light, then the, the guy see the whole teapot. But no, what are you no, saying? He, no, he's saying that you see the same dark side of the moon effect on the other bulbs that create light. Yeah. Like here, the red one's way behind. See, there's the dark side effect. The red light, we're, the, the, we're here, the teapot's here, and the red light's over here. So the, the light side of the red teapot's showing away from us, and we're seeing the back side of the teapot, which we almost don't see at all. So we're, you know, there, because there's no diffuse light in this, in this case, example, he's not using any diffuse light, probably. He's probably, if you look in the source code, you might see that he's using very little diffuse light. Now, if I turn on the ambient light, okay, I see, you know, I can at least, now that the ambient light is lighting up the whole teapot. And if I turn on the view light, of course, now there's no dark, now there's no dark side of the teapot because now the red light's behind the teapot, but the view light's in front, so I lights up the teapot, okay? So, you know, for, so if you want to see the dark side of the moon effect, you turn off the view light, and now... But now if I, uh, I can't actually rotate the light. I, like when I do this, I'm rotating the teapot with the light too. So now there's the light 
in front of the teapot from our point of view. If I turn on the viewpoint light, it's probably gonna wash off. It almost completely washes out the, the light from the, that little red ball, okay? It's kind of a neat demo, okay? This is his only, you know, this is his only example of lighting code. You know, he, he talks about, he, he gives you lots of, he talks a lot about the lighting model, but he doesn't have a lot of examples in his, okay? Now, this is OpenGL 1.1, right? You know, we're doing old OpenGL. Well, in this folder, I put a reference to the original textbook on OpenGL 1.1, which is actually not a bad book. See this book here called the OpenGL Programming Guide? This is the original OpenGL textbook, okay? And it's, on, it's available on the internet. It's actually, they sold hundreds of thousands of copies of this book. It's, it was the Bible of OpenGL programming. It still is actually. The current edition of the book, which is like the 10th edition, is still the Bible for OpenGL programming. But this described the old, old, old OpenGL. And the first, he's got, there's more code examples in here. So if you read this, see this code example here? This, this is the first major code example. I, I rewrote it in Joggle. That's this one down here. So I took this example, light.c, and turned it into light.java. It doesn't do much. Just like the sphere. Okay. But we'll look, you know, it sets up the code to create a sphere and a light. No motion, no animation, no, no, no GUI, but you know, that's one object and one light. Okay. So this is a pretty pure little example. Now, let me just show you real quick what the code looks like. I mean, it's I translated the C code into Java which didn't take much because OpenGL, you know, Joggle almost is just straight, it almost is literally one-to-one -one translation from C to Java. Okay, so there's the basic set. See, there's those arrays. There's the arrays of material, you know, specular material, shininess material, uh, and then there's, okay, these are the specular, and this is the position of the light. So. That array is specular, that's my shyness. That array is the X, Y, Z components of where the light is, okay? Then you, then you, here's where you pass that array to OpenGL and you pass that array to OpenGL. So this is where you're feeding data to the GPU and then you enable lighting, you have to turn it on. Lighting's not on by default. And then you just run, then, then, then OpenGL draws it. Okay. So you pretty much, it's, you just pass these things to it. And the only other thing to do was this, uh, there's the sphere. Yeah. You pretty much just pass data to OpenGL and OpenGL does all the calculations. And then next week we'll look at what those, we'll start looking at the formulas for those calculations. But um, the, the, you, know, you don't do the lighting. You just set up all the parameters and OpenGL does all the lighting. Okay, we'll quit there. <laughs>